place as a um, destination for contemporary cultural tourism. So um, I think we're in a very good way. It takes long, but it's a lovely journey. And we're very happy to have always with us good partners and good friends. Um, in this context of um, our extroversion and international character, we, we welcome tonight this, this team, um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have with us today Lucia Longhi. I used to work with, with her sister, she was our project, our exhibition manager at the Benetton Foundation. We did together some amazing shows in Italy, and I'm very glad now that we work together on this new adventure. Her sister has never come to Lesbos, so she's very jealous now that her sister is here. Um, just some like infor practical information for the night. This is quite an informal event, um, so it's as you might have understood, it's not open to the public. Um, but maybe people will pass by and stop and ask what's going on here. If there are some spaces, some seats, uh, some free seats, they can join. Um, so it's quite an informal event. The idea is that everyone's going to present. First of all, we're going to learn um, what's going on in this sailing boat. Everyone's pretty jealous, I have to say, in the past couple of days, everyone's texting me, how can we join the sailing boat? So I said, we're not organizing, we're just hosting them. <laughs> um, and each one of us could present something um, as, um, as Luci has asked us to do, to bring a short text, a video, um, some photos. Some of these guys have wrote actually poems for the first time in their lives. So wow. We've done our homework. Yay! <laughs> so the idea is that we, we, have, we have dinner, so you can come and go. Please eat them all. We don't want leftovers. Please drink and have a lovely time. Um, and I pass the microphone to Lucia. Feel free to move around, chit chat, and enjoy. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you, Nicolas, and congratulations on this great project you founded. I'm so happy to be here finally uh, after following your adventures thanks to the internet, but I'm so, so happy to be here. On this great island, actually, Lesbos is amazing. We, we already loved it so, so much. Uh, we wish we could stay more, actually. Um, we're sailing back to Turkey tomorrow. Um, so yeah, I will tell you a little bit more about this sailing art residency. So it's called The Language of the Sea. It's a project I conceived more or less one year ago. And I'm, this is the first edition, and I'm really happy. It's, finally taking place. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a one week art residency for artists which takes place at sea on a sailing boat. Uh, it is part of an, on, uh, of an ongoing project um, which is uh, made up of um, residencies, exhibitions and it will happen throughout the upcoming two years. So the sailing, uh, the first edition of the Language of the Sea sailing residency is taking place between Turkey and Greece. We started, we left uh, from Cheshme, we reached uh, Hios, uh, spent two nights there and then we finally uh, reached Lesbos. And um, yeah, two days in Lesbos and then we're sailing back to Turkey, so one week. Um, I personally invited uh, the artist and, and I organized this residency together with Saye Collective, uh, which is a collective uh, born in 2020. Eda is representing, uh, representing uh, Saye and she will say some more words about the collective. So this is also what the act of sailing ignites. And this is why uh, digging into these topics, why sailing on a boat uh, in Mediterranean waters uh, makes sense. It is all about gearing up for the present, um, listening to the waters, to the wind, and seeing these uh, bursting forces uh, as a fuel and not as a threat. 
And then as a further iteration on this concept, uh, indulging on the sea turns into relying on the fate it holds in it, such as the vision or the longing for a new homeland. So, Lesbos, um, one of the ways the Mediterranean waters around Lesbos vividly communicated with the human body is of course the passing of refugees. So, um, there are many, many layers we are exploring, we are talking about uh, in this space. And collision has to be understood as an encounter, as an impact, as a collapse being able to stay in the midst of it all before fixing the damages. The sailing residency welcomes dialogue, encounter, experimentation, attempt and failure, meditation and brainstorming, chaos and silence, touch and distance. So this residency is aimed at becoming uh, a new ingredient to the artist's uh, current research rather than a laboratory for uh, a new resolved artwork. So I'm gonna finish now. The boat uh, is a moving point by definition. It has no roots. It touches many parts. It is the emblem of liberation from land rules. It offers a different angle on nature from which uh, the first and main lesson is simple and shared life. On a boat, the focus immediately switches from the one to the ones, from the ego to the group, grasping on poles of survival, security, mutual understanding. We are exper really experiencing all this in these days, in my opinion. Um, so the boat can turn into a place of international exchange and transdisciplinary discourse, positioning the creative practice as a decentralized model anchored in earth, but swaying on unexpected waters. So this is uh, the language of the sea. This is what we are experiencing. Um, the artist uh, comes from different uh, countries, um, around the Mediterranean, from different European countries. And we will be sharing, um, yeah, something of our research, of our feelings, of our, uh, of ourselves. Saya in Farsi means uh, because of you, like thanks to you. So I think this collective is kind of um, the name itself, kind of uh, explains itself when we say, like thanks to you, I'm here. Like thanks to Lucia and thanks to that we are here and thanks to the artists and thanks to the boat that we are kind of experiencing this language of the sea. And the uh, language of the sea I think inspired me so much because the boat is kind of a family heritage and um, I'm, I have been longing for, an, for a different experience. You know, I've been sailing with family and friends and now we just met on Monday. And we just met like maybe a month ago through video calls. Uh, but now it's like we spent literally too many days and too many moments together that it's kind of feel like family and friends now. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to meet the artists and to be with them and to maybe co-create together. So Saya is based in Asos and Istanbul and I kind of live in Istanbul uh, and try to sail during the summer periods. Uh, the Saya Collective uh, tries to open up space for artists and seekers and uh, we actually start from the body, so we start somatically. So the feelings, the concepts, we try to explore them together under the theme, as um, Lucia said this year's theme is collision, uh, last year it was growth. Open and hold the space under these themes uh, to explore together and to create together. So that's why I think in order, to, in order for you to experience I just in two minutes, if you want, uh, and if you want to be a part of the language of the sea, I invite you here in this space with me.
I am Manuel Rosner, I'm an uh, artist working with digital tools. This is a work from 2017 actually, and what you can see here is a building that I designed for, for an institution in Düsseldorf, which um, is on the, on the lower end of the picture, and then I added this kind of digital sculpture that you experience in virtual reality. So you got with your reality glasses and you were walking into this, um, on the one hand, imaginary building, but since it's shared with others, the experience, it's also existing. Not physically, but it's, it's there, in a way. Um, and we tried with reality, uh, when was it? Yesterday, the day before yesterday, on a boat? Oh, ah, yeah. yeah. And you know all the, all the problems that you have with like keep keeping people healthy so they don't experience like nausea and stuff like this. On the boat it's twice, at least I guess. And also when I made a, made a mistake, there's an elevator in there that you experience with virtual reality classes, so you're supposed to go up, but I made a mistake in the calculation and so you went straight down into the ground. <laughs> and there I had one day of nausea, which you can also get on a boat. <laughs> this is a uh, work from the same year and it's working also with this liquid metal. So a bit like Terminator, Mimetic Polyalloy, which I find a very digital and interesting material. But of course, everything is rooted in nature. So in this digital world, you don't really, sometimes of course, but often you, you, you take your sources from nature and here you try to manipulate it. And also the piece is called wetware because there's hardware, software, which um, everyone knows, I guess, like coding and like really the, the physical material that things run on. And wetware is the human brain. So it's called wetware because everybody exists of water. And yeah, that's what I try to emphasize in this, in this work. These are drawings that I also do in virtual reality and they are fine painted like this, for example. And in contrast to how usually digital objects might be created, it really carries the traces of my body because you can't make this movement in a digital way that is convincing. At least I tried and I failed because yeah, the body has this specific um, shapes that it creates because you can't, it's super hard to create a straight line in this way, but you will always have your, like, your shape inside the book. Um, oh yeah, this one. This is actually a digital version of the Königsgalerie that I made in the Central Land, and now I really have a hard time relating this to a sea experience. But still it has a sky. Huh? <laughs> still it has a sky. <laughs> can I say it's something? Still, sure. Because I experienced, I, I was a lot inside this virtual space, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, and. Uh, w wandering around the space uh, is a bit like when you walk on the boat. I mean, you have to you have to keep your balance. You have to understand. It's not like a house. You have to understand the space, the distance. There are different entrants. It it kind of the way I was moving around the space. It actually recalls me the way I move in a boat. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Something else comes to mind is like the figure over there probably has kind of this experience of the wanderer above the mist yeah. painting. Yeah. A very famous painting where a guy, I think it's romanticism in the 1800s yeah. or 1900s, where he views a valley with clouds and stuff. And we didn't go up the mast, at least, but not yet. yet. Not yet. <laughs> and it not might be yet. similar. When we go through the mist and we're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we going? Oh, and this is a space that I um, kind of claimed for myself next to Neue Nationalgalerie in Berlin, where I dropped this museum um, collection that I have. Um, so also I started working with NFTs and I got some and they are presented in this building. Um, oh, if you're interested, there's 
apps that you can download and experience my work, but I will gladly tell you later how, how that works maybe. And this is the last one that I released. Uh, it's in the Kunsthalle Baden-Baden, and this is a painting that crashes through the wall of the building. And yeah, the force of the ocean is also very surprising sometimes and overwhelming. So, Thank you, Manu. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bankus. I live in Istanbul. Um, I'm quite happy to be here. I wrote this piece in a residency that I did in France last year. Uh, it's a novel about hospitality. And I relate artist residencies directly to the concept of, the, of hospitality. So yeah, let's go. It was two years ago when we came here together. This was one of the places where I feel the happiest. I have always loved Ganesh Labandasa, but he never did. I like its sign, meaning with the circumference with LED lights, the telephone booth from times when people did not have mobile phones, old wooden tables and chairs, the intricate patterns of the upholstery, the Hittite sun mold standing in the middle of the great hall to a half meter store. I know it. Spiral staircases go up three floors. The brass bars on the stairs hold the carpets in place. The dance floor, where I walk with no purpose, with glasses in my hands, drunk and dancing. I love the stained glass mirror behind the bar, the cracked plates, the cutlery gilded painted with motion, most of the dishes. I love it here. That's why, two years ago, I wanted to go to Greenwich Lacantis in Anadolu Hissere, which is on the other side of the bus route. He had told me that he had to go to Anadolu Hissere for work with an exhausted look on his face. I remember that moment well because we hadn't gone out together in a long time. I have to go to Anadolu Hissere for work. Oh, really? How beautiful. delighted inevitably but he looked like someone who had to go to the end of the world he looked as if he had to make an impossible decision he did not reciprocate my enthusiasm he looked at his phone he sighed and he looked up and out the window his gaze went blank i was already excited i didn't want the silence to go on any longer what do you want to do it's not about what I want to do. I have to go to another Lisa for work. Shall we go together? What? To another Lisa, shall we go together? No. We can go to the national campus. Do you want to go all the way there for a tavern? Very unnecessary way to a very unnecessary way to go for a dream. Not because it is necessary, I like Nish Lokantasi. Anyway, as you like. As I like. As if. If I do not know anything, I know myself. I like another researcher, I would be happy in Nish Lokantasi. And if we go there, I thought he would also be happy because I was happy. That was what I believed that day. I knew he was someone else, someone other than me, but at the same time, different than the person he was when I first met him. But I thought, if we go to the national countries together, we could be happy together. As I like. As if. As I know myself, I know what would happen based on experience. We get on a ferry. We don't speak at all. I watch the sea. I watch the cargo ships coming from afar. I wonder if I ever if I have ever seen a submarine, or if the dolphins have arrived in these seas this season. We do not talk. Actually, I do talk. I talk about bridges and cargo ships. He looks at me from time to time, but doesn't say anything. A girl drops her phone in, in the sea. 
Aynı an Fidaz'ın. Bir gel hafta feriyeten o da bir sırrı. Bir göz verin yitirdik o. I take a walk on the promenade. Then I go to a shabby little pub and start drinking beer. In the evening, I go to Ganesh Lokantası. I come early. He's a little late. We don't talk about eating. He doesn't want to talk about his life. He says, let's eat and go home, please. The moment I hear this, I don't like Ganesh Lokantası anymore. I hate those old floors, carpets, and stained glass windows. At that moment, I want to be a deer. Like the young female deer drinking water in the mural on the side of the stairs. Not a depiction of a deer on the wall, though, watching people from a mural stationary. A deer who lives her life in Ganesh Lokantası, but in flesh and bone instead. I want to be a deer in a tavern in Anadolu Hisarı, where customers would stroke my head and feed me all kinds of appetizers. I don't want to be a person anymore, and I don't want to go back to the house in Kiyos. If I go home, I don't know when, maybe in a few hours or in a few days, there will be a rainstorm in the middle of the living room flooding the house with plastic wind. I will cover all the furniture with plastic once again so that they do not get wet and start drinking wine before breakfast. Then the storm will subside. I will remove the plastic covers, open the doors facing each other and wait for the floor to dry. We will go back to our normal lives, both of us hating the national dance. I know what happens next. I imagined, I imagined it and watched it in my head like a movie I know by heart. I could not lose Ganesh Lokantası. That's why I couldn't go back. It was two years ago when we came here together. He went back to his house and I became a deer in Ganesh Lokantası. And I am from Berlin and this is the negative ion generator. And it changes the polarity of air molecules. And I'm going to talk a bit about my last research project um, about air electricity and the um, the, the interactions between um, the outer weather and our inside weather, our imaginal weather. I did some research about a Russian scientist who's called Alexander Chusevsky. And um, he found out uh, that the um, how the sun, the activity of the sun influences human um, behavior and collective human behavior. And um, he found out that always when the sun is um, most active, has its highest point of activity, and then things like wars and revolutions and natural catastrophes happen. And that the sun, the cycle of the sun itself is around 11 years and you can divide it in four phases. And um, the activity of the sun gets um, transferred by, by um, charged particles in the air. So either uh, positive or negative ions, which are basically, yeah, um, exactly oxygen molecules with either um, more electrons or less electrons on them. And um, he, uh, he invented um, a, a tool which is called negative ion generator. And um, this is the original advertisement for it. And basically it's a copper wire structure um, that looks like a chandelier and you could have it at home. And um, it generates basically natural air inside of a room because you find, um, uh, because negative ions are good for us, so the contrary of it, like when bad things happen, is when you have an over-concentration of uh, positive ions in the air. And so this thing does that you have healthy air and natural air inside a room. Because um, negative ions, they come into existence when, for example, um, when you're on the mountain top or when water breaks. This is also the connection with the, uh, yeah, with the water and with the sea, always when you have this little what, sparkling water crashing, the waves crashing at the stones or when you're under the shower and things like that. And in the built environment, 
environment and the human-made environment and especially inside rooms you always have dead air and an over concentration of positive ions. I was exploring this more while I was um, on Lanzarote, which is in, uh, one of the Canary Island and Volcanic Island. Um, and in this kind of landscape you find naturally an uh, over concentration of negative ions. And I was um, walking through the landscape and re um, searching for a state, for, um, for, for a certain state of mind and body to find it in that landscape. And um, symbolically I was walking through my inner emotional landscape. Um, Yes, and yeah, there you can see me walking up a volcano, um, uh, which is also uh, means that I'm just very small, like an insect part of a whole, of a giant hole of um, also non-human beings within intercommunicate with each other. And this uh, scientist Alexander Chisevsky, and um, he found out that um, when he invented this machine, which basically this is a model of it, and you hang it like this, and they, in Russia they also call it um, a soul shower, or iron, uh, uh, iron shower, because the Russian word for um, soul and shower is like douche and dusha, it's very similar. And um, yeah, when you stand under it, it's, very, um, it's like uh, meditation and it clears your, your psyche and your emotional landscape find out how to build this thing and where to get this thing and um, finally I found a very old guy on the eBay client of the eBay of Russia and Vladivostok so almost North Korea and he had one of these things um, and it took 10 months to arrive in Berlin because they didn't want to let it through the, um, the customs this is it this thing, it's like a meter, it looks like a chandelier, and basically it's, it's working, yeah, it's, it's, it's creating an artificial electromagnetic field around this thing, and uh, yeah, changes the polarity of the existing vibration inside of the room. And I got this thing as an original piece from the 50s, from the 1950s, and um, yes, it's working. And I did that over months and built like air rooms and tried to uh, test it on myself. Yeah. And for other people it also worked. And actually, ah, this I want to say, when he invented this thing, he, um, the first thing that got him hooked was like that uh, when his assistant turned the machine on and off, he had this abrupt, like uh, immediate mood swing from like good to bad. And he started experimenting with that, so he first hang that in like greenhouses over plants and then in, um, in how do you say, it? with cows and pigs, the, in agricultural things, and uh, then in hospitals, and he did these therapy sessions then with humans, what you saw on the first picture. Nice. Uh, yes. It accompanies the exhibition we currently have on view. Uh, it has interviews in Greek and English with the six photographs participating in the art in this exhibition. It's quite cheap, so it's a good way to support our activities so we could do more shows and have more food on our tables. <laughs> support our gallery. So this is a book I loved uh, about the sea. Uh, it's written by Nadine Saman, uh, who is a curator, also a friend of some of us. Um, and together with Julian Charrier, uh, who is an artist quite uh, famous, uh, Swiss artist, and they went on an expedition on the Bikini Atto. Uh, I don't want to talk about the book, actually, uh, th but there's a part I relate to, and it really hit me. Um, because to me, um, well, sailing the boat, the sailing boat, is like a prophecies of the human body, and I love the sea, I love the waters, but I think that um, the sea can also be a very, is a very challenging environment for the human body. And there is a part of this book that perfectly describes, um, it's a diving moment. They go down up to um, around uh, 60 meters, down 60 meters. 
and um, nothing. It describes very well the feeling of diving and almost dying because of the sea. I'm sorry, I don't. I didn't want to bring this brutal, but we are experiencing very uh, positive moments uh, with the sea. Um, at the same time, the, I, personally, the more I relate to the water and the sea, the more I realize that um, it's a hate and love feeling because it's also very dangerous and, and blah, blah, blah. So as we slide down a little deeper um, into the water, rightening ourselves, it takes on the green-brown color of crocodile skin and before long visibility is just a meter, our fins barely visible through the fog. We are sinking. But apart from the initial visual uh, register of the pressure, there is no way to tell that we are moving. Except for the altimeter function on our computers ticking away. In less than a minute, we are at 40, 41, 42. And there is no bottom, just blurry darkness. At this rate of descent, you start to think that you will soon hit your limit and that as a matter of necessity, it is time to slow down. So you inject some air into your wing, a conservative amount, so you don't shoot up like a rocket towards the surface. It has no effect. And the computer keeps sticking the meters away, deeper. Still negative buoyancy. You reason that the pressure at this depth is greater than anything encountered in training. So you give it a double, no result. Still falling, now scared. The thought of sinking farther into the yawning uh, chasm beyond recovery is horrifying. At 55 meters, you are charged with adrenaline alert and trying to work it out when all of a sudden you are dunked into a pool of insanity. A wave of intoxication breaks throughout your bloodstream. Your brain enveloped by a tsunami of nitrogen, rendering you dizzy and um, confused. What makes the intoxication so terrifying is that you possess just enough awareness to know that you have lost the thread, that you are unable to make a plan, barely able to make sense of the numbers on your computer. You are out of control and the abyss is taking you. In panic at this realization, you start to breathe heavy. And with heavier breathing comes more narcosis. A downward uh, cognitive spiral. Now you are hyperventilating. You, can, you can't get enough air out of the regulator. It feels like the device is the problem, stopping you from getting the breath you need. You feel like spitting it out, opening your mouth wide, and drink in air, even though the still useful part of your mind knows that this is the worst thing you could do. You know too that freaking out is a great mistake, and so you panic even more. You kick your legs because you no longer trust your wing. No escape, 59, 60, 61, and you turn to look for Nico, the instructor, gesticulating widely to indicate that you have lost control, that you are fucked up. Later, Nico says he saw the fear of death in your eyes. Once Nico sees it, he takes over. He firmly grabs your shoulder, extending his arm and locking his elbow, placing maximum distance between his body and yours while keeping hold. The reason for this, we learn in our rescue training, is that panicking divers has, have a tendency to claw at the person trying to save them, sometimes ripping away their mask or regulator, perhaps, perhaps even trying to steal the latter, abandoning themselves to shameful instincts. He holds you there and, stabilize you, and stabilizes your death. Then he looks you into, the, into your eye and holds you with his gaze, making you understand that he is in control. 
that somebody is delivering you from the anxiety of having to take care of yourself. This done, the panic is gone, despite the remaining narcosis. A few seconds, then a simple gesture, a thumb pointing up, indicating that we should now ascend. And we do, slowly, meter by meter, 60, 59, 58, his hand still, still gripping your shoulder. When you reach 40, though still in, uh, intoxicated, you can feel it start to drop off, like you have passed the apex of this, its bell cure. You can see now that you will not fall any deeper into the trip. You are now ready to take back control of your life. I'm Matthias, I'm a Portuguese French artist. Um, I'm also part of the Fancy. And so, big pleasure to be here. So, a special thanks to like, everyone that's managing this and put us in the position of being involved and, and thinking about water, which is always a topic for me. But, um, today, I want to share with you um, something, not my own work, but like uh, what can be inspiring for, for kind of everyone, but also for my new team and they like a family now already and think about the stations and and yeah I, something I share is actually exchange music but for me it's like a memorial an ocean memorial of slavery actually from the Africans it's actually it's called Texia Texia is uh, actually a techno group um we love to move in for sure uh, and Lexia, they create the myth. They are two DJs, like a pair. And um, they talk about this time of like when the boat were going to Africa, to America in this time. So like uh, that the pregnant women were thrown out of the water from the boat. And that they talk about the civilization that was born underwater as the Black Atlantis. And that this baby was just born with no need of oxygen. And they come out of this of these stories, also like influence for Afrofuturism, but their message is like spread by actually techno music nowadays. So that's why this map is kind of showing how the library just moved and then you also got like Michigan and the select also there and it can be also Atlantis, the real ones like they say it's next to New York, like not far from the US, and they talk about this question of like this black Atlantic coming from like Michigan, and then where techno techno was created in Detroit by like three black DJs. So we'll just show you a video that can explain everything that we're better than This is Drexian Cruiser Control Bubble One to La Dozian Cruiser 8-203X. Please use extra caution as you pass the Aqua construction site on the side of the Aquaban. I repeat, proceed caution. Drexia, the duo of James Stinson and Gerald Donald were the most important electro artists of the 90s. As part of the Underground Resistance crew, they helped pioneer a harder Detroit-focused strain of the genre. But where their fellow Detroiters looked to outer space for inspiration, Drexia went under the sea. Hello, this is Drexia coming here from the TV head. Tell me about the ideas and concepts behind Drexia. The mythology of Drexia was first explained in the liner notes of a compilation called The Quest. The notes describe pregnant African slaves thrown overboard on their voyage to America after they were deemed ill and disruptive. The women ended up giving birth to babies that never needed air, leading to the creation of the Drexian tribes who advanced far beyond the human race. I want to do something that involved a total concept. They take people somewhere else instead of giving them the same thing that they see every single day when they step outside the door. Donald and Stinson lived in Detroit, 
a technology obsessed city that was in decay. And there's a lot of rough characters in Detroit. It's at top to bottom and left to right. You begin to create what you think the world should be, what you think life should be for everyone else. And I think it developed from that. The duo tapped into a school of thought called Afrofuturism, which goes all the way back to Samra's early days in the 1950s. The music is different here, not like Planet Earth. Sun Ra created a cosmic persona for himself, claiming to not only be from the future, but outer space. We set up a colony for black people here. See what they can do on the planet all their own without any white people there. These Afrofuturist themes coursed through black music in the 70s. From the jazz experiments of Miles Davis and Alice Coltrane, to the spaced out dub reggae of Lee Scratch Perry, the electronic funk of George Clinton. It's a very strong belief that we're not from here, that we're from the planet Sirius in the constellation of Orion. If you are Afro-American and you're in a country where your relatives were not able to practice you know, the culture where they were from because they were slaves brought over from Africa, you adapt in other ways. You recreate your universe. It was done a long time ago out of necessity to stay sane in an insane world. As with other artists before them, Stinson and Donald dealt with the trauma and despair of black history and black life by imagining an alternate future. But as part of a new generation gripped by the expansion of electronic music, the sound of Afrofuturism evolved. The early 80s was a critical moment for me at least to experience the whole field of electronic music. The increasing availability of electronic instruments drove this music in a technology-focused, futuristic direction, drawing inspiration from groups like Yellow Magic Orchestra and Kraftwerk. 80s electro and hip-hop evolved, fusing tales of black life with electronic beats and synths. <laughs> While producers like Egyptian Lover borrowed vocoders from Italo Disco to sound even more robotic. I think maybe a lot of the electro in the past, you may have had, you know, artists that deep down they wanted to be R&B stars, whereas direction was like in the opposite direction. Drexia made electro that sounded more futuristic than anything before it. Their fierce arpeggios and rough bass lines reflected the awesome power of water, imitating sea spray and the thrust of tidal waves. The duo fleshed out this underwater world through track titles, label artwork, and occasional spoken word. These were aquatic people who lived in the bubble metropolis. They rode on the aquaban and performed aqua jiu-jitsu. Over the course of eight albums known as the Storm series, the duo pieced together a vivid history of Drexia. In a twist, they expanded their origins from under the sea into outer space, revealing that their ancestors were actually from a far off planet. The music became more open-ended, morphing from aquatic electro into astral electronica. This revelation put Drexia's music in a grand lineage of Afrofuturists, who saw outer space not only as a place to escape to, but their rightful home. In Detroit, we had 
an extraordinary amount of resources about science fiction and fantasy and concepts about space travel were kind of ingrained. The final Drexia album finished the group's story in epic style. The Drexians were finally back on their home planet. The album was named for a star called Bravo 4, which wasn't imaginary. Call the number on your screen or visit us online. Name a star with the International Star Registry. It will be the most talked about gift of the year. Stinson and Donald actually purchased a star and named it Grava 4. This rooted their Afrofuturist narrative in a real existing place. As noted by Afrofuturist Kojo Oshun, Drexia grant themselves the imperial right to nominate and colonize interstellar space. The absurdity of buying and owning a distant star in no way diminishes the contractual obligation that group entered into. Contractual fact meets sonic fiction meets astronomical mapping. By purchasing a star, Drexia left their mark on a tangible part of the universe and made their Afrofuturist fantasy a part of the real world. Though they stopped producing music after Stinson died in 2002, their records live on as the most innovative, futuristic, and inspiring in the electro genre. I think the reason why the Drexia myth endures and inspires so many people now is because it's the story of the underdog. So what Drexia give to everybody is the gift of imagination from a group of people it was stolen from. Grava 4 ends with a track called Astronomical Guidepost. It beckons the listener, or the Drexians, to Use the star chart to plot your path back to Earth using rudimentary astronomical guideposts. This marks the end of a story that has proven one of the most powerful in all of dance music. exhibition that Bill Balasca, he's a Greek artist, that uh, his show opened 10 days ago in Thessaloniki at the Archaeological Museum. It was a commissioned project uh, from the Greek Ministries of Culture. Um, All of Greece, One Culture is the name of the program, Oli Eladanas Politismos. And this year's um, this year's theme was about the 100, um, 100 year anniversary from the Asia Minor catastrophe. So, so Bill is made this. This is Bill's uh, actually who came from um, from the Asia, Asia Minor, and this is the work that uh, he he actually uh, installed at the courtyard of um, the museum. So it's a neon installation that on the, it has two signs. One sign said, one part says, there is no sea without a land, and it flickers, and on the bottom it says, there's no land without a sea. So he asked me to write a piece about this, um, my thoughts about this, um, this work, and I decided to not to write a curatorial text, but write a short story. When I read it to my dad, he says, where did you copy it from? No. <laughs> so I was disappointed by you, dad. He said, my dad told me, when I read it, And it was actually the first time I tried to write a short story um, a bit um, without having anything in mind. I just went like that. So I'm going to write it in Greek. I don't really like how it was translated for the catalog. But you could also, I hope you could actually get to read some of it. So it's a, in Greek it's called Perpatau Kepefto. 
Ιούλιος 2022. Σε μια βόλτα στο κέντρο της Μητυλίνης συναντάω διάσπαρτα τσιτάτα για τη φετινή επέτειο των 100 χρόνων από την μικρασιατική καταστροφή, αναρτημένα σε τεράστια μπάνερ. Περιπλανιέμαι και διαβάζω λέξεις μεγάλες δίπλα σε ασπρόμευρα πορτρέτα γνώριμων προσώπων, βγαλμένα από κάποιο αρχείο. Η ήττα, ο διωγμός, η πατρίδα, η φωτιά, η βάρκα, η ελπίδα. Λέξει χιλιοϊπομένε, φορτισμένε με κάθε λογή νοήματα, επαναλαμβάνονται σχεδόν ποιητικά. Βγαίνουν δε πάντα από το στόμα επιφανών αντρών. Σε ποιο φάκελο ξέχναν άραγε οι σπουδαίε γυναίκε τη εποχή. Συνεχίζω τον περίπατό μου και ενημερώνομαι για τι δεκάδε προγραμματισμένε εκδηλώσει που θα γίνουν στο νησί σχετικά με τι αλυσμόνητε πατρίδε και του ανθρώπου του. Βραδιέ οργανωμένε από δραστήριου συλλόγου τη περιοχή με τη συμμετοχή καταξιωμένων καλλιτεχνών. Θα παρουσιάσουν μαρτυρίε και αφηγήσει για να θυμηθούμε, να τιμήσουμε, να συγκινηθούμε. Για να διατηρήσουμε στη μνήμη μα ότι η Λέσβο αποδείχθηκε φιλόξενη γη για του μικρασιάτε πρόσφυγε που βρήκαν από κούμπι μετά το ξεριζωμό του. Μου τραβάει το ενδιαφέρον μια παράξενη αφίσα η οποία φέρει τον τίτλο Από την καταστροφή στη δημιουργία και φωτογραφίζει τη διαδικασία τη ολοκληρωτική μεταμόρφωση μια κάπια σε πεταλούδα. Πρωτότυπη προσέγγιση στο θέμα, σκέφτομαι. Και ασυνέστητα κοιτάζω αντίκρι, βορειοανατολικά, τα λαμπερά φωτάκια που θερμοπέζουν στα παράλια τη Μικρά Ασία. Πάντα μου έκανε εντύπωση πόσο κοντά είναι απέναντι όχθη του Αιγαίου. Το επαναλαμβάνω σε όσου φίλου επισκέφτονται τη Λέσβο, προτείνοντα μια εκδρομή στο Ιβαλί. Στη διαδρομή, μια σειρά ερωτημάτων, που βλέπουν, ερωτημάτων μου βλέπουν την πραγματικότητα με το φαντασιακό. Τι χωρίζει το νησί μου από την αντίπερη στεριά. Τι κρύβεται στο μεταξύ υδάτινο διάστημα, τι πίστατε η θάλασσα χωρί τη ξηρά, τι ξηρά δίχω στη θάλασσα. Τι μαθαίνουμε από το νερό που μα περικλεί, πώ το ρευστό αυτό στοιχείο ορίζει την οπτική μα για το περιβάλλον, τη γεωπολιτική αλλά και την οικονομία. Προχωρώ κατά μήκο τη προκειμένη, χαμένο στου συλλογισμού μου. Το περπάτημα λένε ότι λειτουργεί ω διαλογισμό, οξύνει τόσο την δημιουργική όσο και την κριτική σκέψη. Σταματάω στο περίπτωρο και χαζεύω τα πρωτοσέλιδα. Θύελα αντιδράσεων για το φιάσκο με την κατοχύρωση του, τόρου, του όρου Τουρκετζίαν ω εμπορικού σήματο από το γείτονα Τουρκία για λόγου τουριστική προβολή. Τι νοσή είναι, βρε παιδιά, το πέλαγο, ακούγεται όλο καημό μια φωνή από το βάθο του μικρού καταστήματο. Ο αναστεναγμό τη πολυμήχανη ιδιοκτήτρια μου έφερε κατευθείαν στο μυαλό τη χαρακτηριστική φιγούρα του Σόλων Αλέκα να ερμηνεύει αμανέδε σε μια φιλική συγκέντρωση. Πριν μερικά καλοκαίρια. Μια ιδιαίτερη περίπτωση τόπιου καλλιτέχνη, ο οποίο πρέσβευε μια ολόκληρη γενιά που δυστυχώ χάνεται. Η μουσική θησαυρή που διέσωσε επισημαίνουν την ανθρώπινο, τον ανθρώπινο πόνο στη διαχρονική του διάσταση. Υπογραμμίζουν ότι το σώμα μα συνιστά πεδίο υπαρξιακών, κοινωνικών και ιδεολογικών μαχών. Από την άλλη, αποτελεί φυσικά και αστήρευτη πηγή ενέργεια, επινοητικότητα και δημιουργία. Το βλέμμα μου τρέχει ξανά απέναντι πιο χαμηλά αυτή τη φορά. Ο ουρανό είναι καθαρό και έτσι μπορεί να διακρίνει όλα τα μικρά χωριά στο βάθο. Προσπαθώ να προσανατολιστώ, να εστιάσω στο σημερινό οικισμό τη Μπέργαμα. Επιχειρώ να φανταστώ τη μεγαλοπρεπή αρχαία πόλη τη, η οποία στο πέρασμα των αιώνων απογυμνώθηκε από σπουδαία μνημεία και άλλα αρχιτεκτονήματα με εξαιρετικά βίαιο τρόπο. Ανοίγω τα μάτια μου πίσω στη Μητυλίνη και παρατηρώ προσεκτικά τριγύρω. Ο δημόσιο χώρο γίνεται αφορμή για εξερεύνηση στην αρχαιολογία του πρόσφατου αστικού παρελθόντο. Κάτω από τα διαφημιστικά για τι δράσει τη επαιτίου του 1922, εντοπίζω ίχνη από του περσινού εντυπωσιακού πανηγυρικού. Αυτού για τον εορτισμό των 200 χρόνων από την Ελληνική Επανάσταση του 1821. Απαγγέλλω τα θράσματα με χαμηλή και ήρεμη φωνή. 
ένα καθοριστικό γεγονός, η ανάδειξη των αγώνων, η θυσία του λαού μας, ανοσοχασμός για το παρόν και κυρίως για το μέλλον της χώρας. Αναγνωρίζω την ευθύνη που να ζει σε μια κομβική κουκίδα του χάρτη στο σταυροδρόμι μεταξύ Δύση και Ανατολή. Σε ένα ιστορικό νησί στο σύνορο τη Ευρώπη, το οποίο έγινε ακόμα πιο γνωστό μετά το 2015, ω μείζον σημείο τη σύγχρονη προσφυγική και μεταναστευτική κρίση. Ένα μαγικό τόπο που εν μία νυχτή μετατράπηκε σε συνώνυμο τη τραγωδία, σε τουριστικό προορισμό προσωποφυγή. Μήπω φτάσει κανένα νεκρό μορέλι και στην παραλία σα και μα χαλάσετε το πε. Μα έστειλε η οικογένεια από το Παγκόσμιο Βορρά, ακυρώνοντα την κράτησή τη. Ακολούθησαν κι άλλε πολλέ. Μετράω τι προκλήσει των τοπικών κοινωνιών, οι οποίε αντιμετωπίζουν με υπομονή και ανησυχία τη δυσμενή κατάσταση των τελευταίων ετών. Αναθεωρώ τι προοπτικέ βελτίωση τη ποιότητα ζωή των κατοίκων τη Λέσβου και τη αναζωογόνηση τη καθημερινότητά του σε μια περίοδο αναβρασμού. Αναρωτιέμαι ποια είναι τελικά η σημασία των επιτείων και πώ η συμμετοχή στι γιορτέ μα συνδέει με σταθμού τη νεότερη ελληνική ιστορία. Με ποιου τρόπου αντανακλούν την αντίληψη μια ταυτότητα που ορίζεται από τη δημιουργία του κράτου και την εγκατάσταση ενό και πλέον εκατομμυρίου προσφύγων τη μικρασιατική καταστροφή, στοιχείου καθοριστικού για την κοινωνική και πολιτισμική εξέλιξη τη χώρα. Ποιο είναι ο ρόλο του καλλιτέχνη σε αυτό το πλαίσιο, όπου ο αδιάκοπο εκτοπισμό πληθυσμιακών ομάδων επαναπροσδιορίζει το σπίτι ω κατασκευή. Προβολή και προσδοκία. Είναι τυχαίο ότι στι μέρε μα η παγκόσμια καλλιτεχνική κοινότητα διερευνά συστηματικά τι έννοιε τη φροντίδα και τη θεραπεία. Τα γεγονότα του 1922 αποτελούν ένα τόπο τιμή, ένα τόπο μνήμη μάλλον, με διανοητικέ και υλικέ προεκτάσει, ο οποίο ισορροπεί ανάμεσα στην επιθυμία αποφυγή τη λύθη και στην επιδίωξη διαμόρφωση μια καινούργια αλήθεια. Η αλήθεια του καθενό όμω συνδέεται συνολικά με φορεί, με θεσμού και πρακτικέ σε αναζήτηση δικτύων υποστήριξη, επικοινωνία και αλληλεγγύη με σκοπό την επιβίωση. Σε κάθε περίπτωση, η αγωνιώδη προσπάθεια των ανθρώπων να συνεπάρξουν μα υπενθυμίζει ότι η ιστορία κινείται διαρκώ κυκλικά. Τα πράγματα έρχονται, φεύγουν, επιστρέφουν. Έχουν πολλέ όψει που αξίζει ίσω να ανακαλύψει ακόμα και αν φοβάσαι ότι θα σε αλλάξουν. Πιστεύω πω οι εορτασμοί επιβεβαιώνουν ότι είμαστε ζωντανοί και ικανοποιούν την ανάγκη μα να ανήκουμε. Ο Πασχάλη Κιτρομιλίδη τονίζει σε μια πρόσφατη συνέντευξή του ότι θα μπορούσαμε να σκεφτούμε τι επαιτίου ω μια άσκηση οριμότητα. Αντίστοιχη με εκείνη που είχε επιδειχθεί κατά την κρίση τη πανδημία. Περπατάω και πέφτω, σηκώνομαι και συνεχίζω. My name is Melina. I was born and raised on the island. I left the island when I was 18 years old. And since then, I come back with every opportunity. Uh, when I was a little child, my favorite place on the island was at Talu, just three kilometers south of Molibos, uh, the place where my mom was born, uh, my grandma, my, oh, I mean all, the, all my relatives. And my, I was in love with a specific house near the sea. Actually, it wasn't a, a, a house near the sea, it was a house inside the sea. You can still uh, find it if you go to Eftalou. It's there. This is a place where a refugee from the Asia Minor in, two, uh, in 1922 uh, came and built it on his own. It was a makeshift house. And uh, one side of the house was inside the water. Now, I found a beautiful article about the son of Psaroyanos. Uh, Psaroyanos was the, the dad. Uh, it was, the, the article was about the, the son. Uh, Psaroyanos uh, was uh, inspired the director and there is even a movie about him out there, a Greek movie, and it was a bit uh, controversial and very good, it received very good critics. Now, this, the, the song Psarandonis, Psarandonis means Andonis of the, of the fishes, okay? It's like a specific nickname. Uh, people give here to specific people based on the profession. So, I'm gonna, 
uh, narrate a testimony by a very, very good friend of mine who died this year, a famous psychiatrist, psychotherapist, who did, the, he was not from here, uh, but he happened to do his uh, rural medical doctor, uh, let's say, assignment for two years in the 80s. And he met Sarandoni. I was a rural doctor in Molgos back then in 1985. I was one, it was one of those nights that I first went to Andoni's hut, Andoni's house. <coughs> the reason was a rash he had on his wrist, a skin disease. And his wife had begged me, if the road sometimes took me out of Eftalou, to stop and look at it because Andonis was adamant in his denial not to go never to the village. The medical visit began with all the, specific the specifications of a proper medical procedure. I, want, I went there in the dead of winter without a flashlight to examine a rash in a hut that had no electricity. But I had a bottle of Uzo with me because a friend when he found out that I intended to go visit Antoni, said to me, when you go, take a bottle of Uzo with you. It's not right to go empty-handed. You'll need it. So, a medical visit with a bottle of Uzo? The only excuse I had was that I was 28 years old. I saw Antoni every night, every time I passed his house on my, my way to the thermal baths of Eftalu. I already knew about him that his father, Psaroyanos, was a fisherman on the opposite coast of Asia Minor and had, had come as a refugee in 1922. The life and personality of Psaroyanos, as I told you before, was uh, made uh, a movie. But this is another story. Uh, Antonis, he lived in his uh, hut, in his... Uh, house, let's say this makes it house, he fished all the time, day and night, in a small boat. He never went to the, the, the village. His figure was stooped, was like this, his body. He always had a white scarf tied on his head. He had the reputation of a passionate animal lover, but in reality he was much more. He was a charmer of all living creatures of all living things. He had a seagull for company that he had tamed while his cats were so devoted to him that when they saw him return from fishing, they, they would die. The cats, the, cats hate water, eh? cats hate uh, the sea, but they would dive into the sea and swim to his boat to welcome him. At one end of the beach, he had dug a pit deep enough to fill with seawater, which he used as an aquarium. There he put whatever fish seemed beautiful or strange to him, and he kept them there, just to look at them and enjoy them. In front of the hut, there was a small makeshift harbor that barely accommodated his boat. His father has, had started building it with all the children in the family carrying stones, but the problem was that the waters were very shallow, shallow and the wave was constantly bringing stones and sand into his little port, making it impossible for the boat to feed. For this reason, Antonis, every day he was taking his eggs, his pig eggs, his matok, as they say, uh, axina, as we say in Greek, and every day dig the bottom. But if you were a passerby, you would see a man inside the sea digging the sea. And this was amazing. Imagine someone digging the sea. So his house was a beautiful stone hut built on the sand, leaning against a large rock, which also served as one of the four walls. One wall of the house was a rock, and the other wall was literally on top of the way. 
The entrance was a low, low gate. It was on the opposite side of the rock, and the fourth wall was on the side of the beach road of Eftalu, a small dirt road. I will always remember the first time I stepped through that gate on that rainy winter night. I had to stoop very low to pass it. And the first picture my eyes formed was a composite of many different incomprehensible elements. The space was lit only by a small fire, by a primitive fireplace placed on the wall that was wet from the sea. So the wall was wet from the icy sea water on the one hand and dried by this fire on the other. But the strangest thing of all was an indeterminate fairy bundle, a fairy mountain that was cats, his cats. He was living there with a mountain of cats. The space was much smaller than one would imagine if one measured the outside dimensions of the, of the hut, because the rock was not vertical. So it occupied a large part of its interior. The hut was low, and from the roof hung many, many bags, the content of which were later revealed to me. Antonis was lying on a bed placed in front of the rock. He had this skin disease. He was welcoming me, and I could hear him at the same time crying, sweetly, on the one hand cursing himself, and on the other speaking tenderly to, the, to, the, to a kitten that he was holding in his arm. I was a spectator of a scene full of uh, sadness, of mourning such as we see in ancient tragedies. I had watched Andonis many times mourn the death of a cat or a dog, as I have all, also witnessed his wife, a friend, or a neighbor panicking about the possibility that Andonis would be informed that a cat or a dog had died, or even a seagull. So what happened? Arafat, which he called Iarafat in, 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 in the local dialect, Iarafat, had given birth to three kittens and everything was going well until suddenly Adonis found two of the three dead, while the third appeared to him to be in rather bad condition. Then Adonis remembered that a few days before he had sprayed some insecticide on the fur, on the, the animals, because they were full of fleas. He immediately washed the surviving kitten and now he was holding it lovingly in his arms and apologizing to himself for the harm he had done to him. Meanwhile, Arafat, the kitten's mother, joined the fairy mountain and didn't seem to share Andoni's pain. On the occasion, Andonis introduced me to all his cats, not just by their name, but also telling a short story about each one or mentioning a small characteristic of their personality. This is Carolos. Give him a brim every day and take his soul, a special local fish. For Adonis, each cat had, had its own identity and he had a special relationship with it. Even the fact that the, na the names were male or female, regardless of the cat's gender, was due to Adonis' view that sometimes a personality trait can be more pronounced than the gender. For example, the cat named Arafat was a rebel. That was what set her apart from other cats, not her gender. It was a female cat. <laughs> that night, the Uzo served us because Antonis quickly prepared the good meze without having to leave his bed. Everything he needed was at his arm's length. He put fresh fish in the fireplace to cook, reaching out to reach all the hanging bags that had all the good things in the world. Salt fish, pasta, as we call them here, uh, but also cutlery and napkins. Even to feed the fire with wood, he did not have to get out of bed. His premises 
were inside the sea and everything was like at arm's length and everything was uh, in a good proportion to his humanity. The wood was stacked under the bed. He just had to reach out, pick one up and put it in the fireplace. When we parted that night, I returned to Moligos. Antonis went into his boat at night and in the rain to collect his fishing uh, net. We had both forgotten about the rush on his team. <laughs> this is in memory of Costas Gujamanis, my friend, uh, 1957, 2022, a psychiatrist and a very, very good sailor. Mm. Uh, it's been truly inspirational meeting you all of the artists and uh, everything that's been shared, even the movement. Uh, it was a fantastic icebreaker. Um, so today I've brought an object. Uh, firstly, my name is Dimitris Bulgaredis. I'm second generation Greek. My father was from Lesbos and uh, he left this island when he was 16 years old to start a new life. And obviously, okay, I was born in South Africa, Cape Town, which is where he went. But I was always curious as a child to um, find my roots on the island of Lesbos. So I've been coming here for many, many years, um, exploring, trying to find the, my, my roots to, um, and the love that I've, uh, that, that's been developed over all these years for this island. And uh, within my searching and uh, speaking to all the village people from the village where he came from. Um, I found an object that he had made when he was about 12 years old. Um, and it's a boat. Um, his name was Nicolas Bulgarelis. And uh, I found this to be quite a work of art for such a young age. Um, there's some interesting objects that he used. So the other reason, I mean, for, for, for selecting this object I guess for me on a personal level, um, it, it takes me to two academics. Um, the first one is Heraclitus, who, who, who coined the term um, tapatari, which uh, I don't know if any Greeks can explain that. In English, it would mean in constant flux, forever changing. Yes, thank you. Um, so the object for me, um, I don't know, it, it sort of holds something um, in that sense because the, the, the element of water is always in constant change and flux. So, and then the second historian that came to mind with this object would be Emil Nora. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this uh, historian, French historian, that coined the term Le Lieu de Mémoire. Um, so he, he basically uh, takes collective memory and history and a place. And uh, he wrote fantastic work about um, the study of memory, memory studies. So for me, this holds strong memories and it also holds the state of constant flux. And that's why I thought I'd share this object with you tonight. Thank you. My name is Georgos uh, Katsaros. I'm living here. <coughs> I'm a local artist. Thank you for inviting me. And I brought with me two pieces uh, that I have a lot of years on my own. This is two pieces uh, from the sea. Uh, these two pieces reminds me of my father, uh, who happened to meet my friend Julie before years. Uh, she, uh, he was a fisherman and a diver, a professional diver, working with companies uh, making a uh, uh, port in Miami. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these two things inspires me and remember uh, of him, and inspires me because they are organic forms uh, the unpredictable lines and shapes 
uh, traveled me through a lot of stories. Uh, and so I, that, that's my connection with uh, the sea and uh, the flow of uh, the liquid element. Uh, that's all. I do not have to say something else. Thank you very much. I didn't uh, describe that this is a spawn, a sea spawn, yeah, everybody knows. And uh, this is one of the pieces that my father was uh, collecting wow. for a lot of years. So that's why I have to remember him. And uh, the rock is the opposite, like uh, material. I mean. My name is Julie Loy. I'm very proud to be here tonight. I have been on the island for more than 15 years and I came up with this. You know, my second favorite dream is when I dream that I fly. Weirdly enough, I always fly with my feet in the front, <laughs> possibly because of the position. Um, it's such a free feel of the body, but my favorite, my first favorite, dream is when I dream that I swim and I can breathe on the water. Now this is my favorite dream. <laughs> it brings me peace of body, peace of mind. So when I got the invitation to think about the body and the sea, um, I couldn't refrain of thinking of the body is at sea, my body at sea, I swim every day, also in the winter I try, I love it, it's just I feel much better in the sea, I think I was, a, maybe I still am, a sea creature, for sure when I meet um, phosphorizate plankton, I know I was a phosphorizate plankton, I know, <laughs> you laugh, but I know, <laughs> no I also laugh, um, Living on an island is like living on the oasis in the middle of the salt water. It's an oasis for the traveler, it's an oasis for the birds. So there is this horizontal connection between the islands that are also tip of mountains. It's there where the earth pierces the waters and reaches for the stars. And this also creates a body, it creates energy. Living on an island and the sea is full of corpses. Swimming every day and this fear of encountering the body that washed off. One day I was really freaked out, I don't know, it really was not leaving me this. I was fighting every day to swim in, in the big floods of migration we had recently. And my hand touches something. And I <coughs> take the courage to look at it. It was a leaf, the leaf of a black hand. Oof. Okay, it's not a real hand. And then I continue swimming and say, you see, you're just full of fears. It doesn't matter. Go on swimming. And tap my hand touches something else and it's a hand and it's a plastic glove <sighs> fear following me so to symbolize this the sea the freedom the peace i brought along a map a friend made um, I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the slate? Is it? Yes, it's uh, Mare Liberum. It's, um, it's been made by an um, underground printer collaboration to raise funds and to survey the activities at the sea when there was a lot of migrants that were not being recorded. And this map is, can be found all over Europe. The creator of this map has 
planted a little island that doesn't exist in reality. He says that's where he would love to live. He's a great sailor. There are other symbolic objects for the peace of mind and peace of body at sea. My son was uh, um, delighted and proficient with uh, um, mythology, Greek mythology. And he does sailing as well. He's now 11 years old. But when he was five, he, he was making his uh, flag. So this is a flag. <laughs> it has a hole here that you can put a stick. And we were raising this flag in some demonstrations as well. In solidarity with the people who should have free access. <laughs> voilà. Thank you very much. Και σε αρχή να πω ένα μπράβο στους γονείς σου που είναι εδώ αυτό το βράδυ και σε καμαρών και σε βοηθάνε και είναι εδώ. Να πω ότι εγώ δεν έχω καμία σχέση με την τέχνη. Δεν έχω κάποια ειδική παιδεία. Ωστόσο, μου αρέσει να ασχολούμαι με ανθρώπους που ασχολούνται με την τέχνη. Και μου αρέσει να τους ξεχωρίζω και να γράφω και για αυτούς. Όπως είναι εδώ ο Νικόλας, όπως είναι ο Γιώργος. Δεν είναι εύκολο να γράφεις. Ε, και δεν είναι εύκολο για το λόγο ότι εγώ προσωπικά όταν δεν μου αρέσει κάτι, παλεύω για να το γράψω, απλά για να το διεπαιώ. Όταν όμως μου αρέσει κάτι, ζωγραφίζω. Because of her Instagram stories, I can see that she plays theater, and she draws, and she writes, she's a journalist and an actor, and she says, I'm not into the arts at all. Όχι, δεν είμαι. Λοιπόν, τις προάλλες με κάλεσε ο Νικόλας, μου είπε ότι θα κάνω μία εκδήλωση, θα είναι γι' αυτό και γι' αυτό το λόγο, και θέλω να έρθεις κι εσύ. Και του λέω, και πώς θα έρθω, και τι θα φέρω, και μου λέει, κάνει κάτι που να έχει σχέση με τη θάλασσα και το σώμα. Εμένα το πρώτο πράγμα που μου ήρθε στο μυαλό, γιατί χτες έκατσα να το κάνω, γιατί δεν είχα χρόνο λόγω δουλειά, ήταν η παραλία του χωριού μου, η Κράτα. Οπότε επέλεξα να έχω μερικές φωτογραφίες και να γράψω και ένα μικρό ποίημα, που ήταν η πρώτη φορά που έκατσα να γράψω ποίημα. Για να κάνω τη χάρη στην Νικόλα. Λοιπόν, ο τίτλος του ανέκδοτου ποιήματός μου έχει τίτλο «Κεχράδα Μπρε Μαρέν». Ε, το όνομα «Κεχράδα», η τσιχράδα μάλλον, ε, κατάγεται από την ονομασία «Κεχράδα». Ε, είναι ένα μέρος που έχω τις παιδικές μου αναμνήσεις, που συνεχίζω να χτίζω αναμνήσεις, γιατί θέλω να επιλέγω τα μέρη που μεγάλωσα. Δεν το κάνουν όλοι αυτό, είναι καλό να γνωρίζεις και άλλους τόπους, Εντάξει, εγώ είμαι τοπική στρία με την καλή έννοια. Λοιπόν, ήταν η στροματσάδα με τα ξαδέρφια μου και την αδερφή μου παραμονές Αγίου Παντελεήμωνα. Ήταν που θα άφηνα το χέρι του Γιώργου όταν φτάναμε στο σπίτι. Ήταν η μάσκα και ο αναπνευστήρας που δεν ξεκολούσε από πάνω του ο Κώστας αν δεν παπάριαναν πρώτα τα δάχτυλά του. Ήταν το μπλε διάφανο στο σύμπι και αργότερα τα άσπρα ροζ μπρατσάκια. Ήταν τα μπισκότα Παπαδοπούλου που είχε η μαμά μου στη τη Μεγάλη Τσάντα που με την αλμύρα της θάλασσας τα χείλη γινόταν ακόμη πιο ωραία. Ήταν η πλάτη του μπαμπά που πατούσε να πάρω φόρα για να κάνω τη βουτιά. Ήταν οι πρώτες μέρες αυτονομίας που με το σακίδι στο νόμο μπαίναμε στην καρότσα να πάμε για βάνιο με τις φίλες. Ήταν που προσπαθούσα να κάνω μακροβούτια και όλο έπινα νερό μέχρι που έμαθα πόσο σημαντική είναι η ανάσα. Ήταν που έπαιρνα αγκαλιέ μέσα στο φω τη νύχτα, έχοντα μια αίσθηση ασύλου τη ελευθερία. Ήταν που έφτιαξα κάστρα με την κόρη τη φίλη μου. Ήταν οι τεράστιε μαύρε σακούλε από τι εξορμή τη καθαριότητα. Ήταν που δεν είχε ποτέ τσουφέ στη θάλασσα των παιδικών μου χρόνων. Ήταν και θα είναι η ψυχράτα μου.
Hi, uh, I'm Tassos. I was born and raised here in Lesbos. I live in Athens. Uh, I want to thank Nicolas about everything he does here for the island. It's very like, it's, it, for me it's huge, it's huge, and I want to congratulate uh, his parents as well uh, for like, in, not only like supporting, but empowering him to do it. I know that this was uh, his mom's house, and imagine that his mom like getting a house to do a gallery. It's, it's huge, it's huge. <laughs> Uh, I'm very, very good in words, uh, like, take, like, and my uh, connection with the art is very superficial and began like some years ago. I like going to contemporary galleries and museums, and, but uh, mostly I like to express myself in my photographs, um, I'm like an amateur photographer. So uh, when um, Nicholas told me, like, you have a homework to do, I would just came here, I wrote it like yesterday, and it was very, I was stressed out, I put it like pretty, so I just picked up a uh, photograph from my Instagram account and uh, as I told you, uh, I'm not very good in the world, so I would like to see the picture uh, I took like uh, five years ago in Kithira and maybe you can take the microphone and say something what like you feel when you saw this piece because uh, just in this way I just uh, express how I feel, but I, I, I cannot do it in words so maybe you can do it on behalf of me if you want. Uh, this is my friend uh, uh, Roy from Israel, and he just died. I took a picture of him, and I like if you see it's uh, reversed, and the beautiful bottom, sea bottom of um, uh, Kithi, right? It, it, it's like uh, a marvelous, like beautiful island. Uh, so this is my connection with the sea. Uh, the photographs. It's not like diving or swimming. It's like taking photographs of the sea. So, uh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you all, and for you for it was an amazing experience for me. Thank you. No, it's not in the cave. It's in Kalafi Beach. Kalafi, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's there. It's. it's, it's. But, uh, is this, uh, this is the bottom, and this is the surface of the sea. This is the surface of the sea. I just. Flipped the okay, picture. So it's upside down. It's upside down, yeah. It's that upside down. Like because I find it more artistic to do it in this way, just, uh, uh, rather than put it in the right. Uh, okay, you are not using words, but I think you are marvelous using words. <laughs> uh, thank and, you. And, and uh, if I was going to put a caption on this photograph, I would use the Leonard Cohen's uh, oh. verse, which is there is a crack. In everything, that's how the light gets in. Because the reason. Yeah, and now the, the colors the are not very good here because of the projector, but it's uh, yeah, it's fantastic and so the reflection. And the light gets in. It, and, indeed. Uh, and his dive is what brings the light in. It, it, it's unedited, it's not edited. That's it's just. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. It's, thank you. it's wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>